Welcome, everyone, and thank you so much for tuning in. So my name is David Walters, and I run the book review blog, Fanfight Addict, and I am so, so happy to be here today. Uh, thanks to Matt and the rest of the team at The Broken Binding for setting up today's session with none other than the amazing Matthew Ward, the author of the Legacy Trilogy, published by Orbit Books. Matthew, how are you doing this morning or in your part of the world this afternoon? Not too bad. It's the start of the week, but nothing has gone wrong yet. So we will see what happens and see whether we get out of this without anything going wrong. But I'm sure it'll be fine. <laughs> it's good to hear. Yeah, you just really never know how Mondays are going to go, right? You, you you get the weekend, it goes by way too quickly, and then Monday hits and you're like, man, if only this was Sunday again. <laughs> so I'm glad to hear uh, nothing's gone wrong yet. Um, so, uh, I just want to know, like, you know, how, how how anxious are you, you know, about the new release coming? I mean, it's like, it's almost upon us. I mean, it's it's in, you know, it's in a week. I mean, it's so close. Uh, you know, are you excited? Are you nervous? Uh, are you just ready for it to all be over with? <laughs> um, I think it's going to be great to actually see it out in the world. Um, weirdly, I've been slightly fatalistic about things, I think. Uh, I don't tend to get nervous about things that I can't affect. So it will now it will now come out. It's all done. There's nothing I can do about it. Uh, <laughs> I mean, assuming that you know all the books don't spontaneously vanish or something like that, or it disappears off uh, Kindle readers and things like that. But yeah, there's there's not much I can do. All the nervousness happens when you're trying to get it done. Uh, mm -hmm. I think in the first place and go right. Have I done everything? Does this match up with this? Does this match up with that? So at this point, it, it is what it is, and I, and. Uh, yeah, I refuse to worry about it. <laughs> but I say at this point, at this now point, you know, like, yeah, but I say at this point, you know, like I've been through the book multiple times. My editors have been through the book multiple times. It's just time to be done. Yeah. <laughs> and, and and best of luck, book. <laughs> so, you um, just let them go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, there's there's a joke that that Brian Regan does. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with his stand up comedy, but uh, he talks about. Um, you know, his wallet, uh, you know, th think of a, of a child like letting go of a balloon and watching it just float away into the sky and being very upset about it. And, you know, parents are like, don't worry, we'll get you another one. He's like, imagine if you're an, an adult and your wallet just floats out of your back pocket and just starts flying away. You do the exact same thing. That's what you're doing with your book. You just you're just kind of like go away, but like not too far. <laughs> Oh man, and I can I can only imagine. I mean, you know, you, you get nervous with you know your first book coming out, and you're like, okay, I feel like I'm I've got well trodden ground now for your second book, and then you're like, oh crap, now it's the finale. Like this one's got to hit home, you know. So I can I can only imagine all the the range of emotions. Yeah, it's it's kind of nice because um, like how the publishers uh, review yeah, publishers weekly review. Let's get the words in the right order. That always helps. Um, a few few weeks ago now, and, and that landed quite nicely. It got itself a starred review over there. So I, I have at least that little bit of, no, 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 it's not completely dreadful. Someone has read it. Someone has read it and they liked it enough to give it a star. So we're probably okay. Um, so that, that's a nice little boost. But obviously, we'll start to see more bits and pieces come in over the next couple of weeks. So Absolutely. We, we will see what happens. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I know you get the big tour going, which, you know, we're doing this chat for, uh, you got a lot of reviews coming in for that, a lot of Q and A's and, uh, some, some guest posts. So definitely looking, looking forward to all those that are coming out. So, um, I, I want to go back to the very beginning, Matthew. I want to, I want to know who is Matthew Ward and why did he become a writer? <laughs> I, I, I always hate that question. I hate talking about myself, but that's, uh, we will see what we can do. Um, so, why did I become a writer? I have always loved stories, but I think it took me a long time to get to a point where I was confident telling them. Um, because I, I think, as with a lot of people, you go through you go through the school system and they go, "Ah, oh, you can do this. We don't have to try and get you to do this thing properly." So go and do that. Focus on that thing over there. So for years and years and years, I was locked down into sciences and maths and bits and pieces and then suddenly realized that I actually hated all of it uh, <laughs> but by then it was kind of too late um so by the time I actually left um I, I left sort of a levels I had a levels in science and maths and no idea what I was supposed to be doing with myself 
because I knew it wasn't that. I knew I didn't want to spend the rest of my life doing that, which, you know, it's 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 fine for that. They are incredibly useful things and I'm more power to people who love them, but it just wasn't for me. Um, and so after a while, I ended up actually getting what at the time was the dream job working for Games Workshop in their games development team, which was very much um, not from the rules side rather than the fiction side. But as time goes on, you end up multitasking, you get, you get better, you hone some of those skills. Uh, and by the time Workshop and I parted ways, I got to the point where, no, no, this is... I can do this now. I have the confidence to go away and actually do stuff that is actually proper storytelling um, in prose in whatever length that I want it to be. And yes, I can go and do this. Uh, so I sort of took it from there, really. And that would be, oh, that's like seven years ago. T time has gone very funny this last couple of years. But yes, I think it's about seven years ago now. Um, and I've never really looked back while I'm still um, my day job insofar as there's a distinction is uh, working as a creative consultant on all kinds of bits and pieces uh, but again that's always from sort of narrative character storyline fiction and all the rest of it uh, at least two of those words were just the same thing but with a different word behind them but that's fine uh, but um, yeah everything I do now is is basically narrative fiction on one type, kind or another, be it scripts for video games, whether it's sort of narrative overview or a little bit of script offering, or of course the novel writing. Um, and that all that all goes into a pot and then I get to the start of the week and go, right, what was the most urgent thing again? <laughs> what do I do now? Uh, beyond the writing, um, I have a house full of Lego, some of which you can see behind me, but it's by no means all of it. Um, I have a lot of very happy cats uh, who have been shut out of this room, so they do not climb over me while we're talking. And uh, I've ended up culturing this sort of very strange interest with the London Underground and its history and all the abandoned stations and bits and pieces, very little of which can actually be seen from here. But over on this side, I've actually got a line diagram from one of the stations that's sort of a restored vintage thing and stuff like that. So, yeah. Just about on the line of saying, I think, but uh, everyone <laughs> has their own threshold. But I say just toe on it. <laughs> yeah, when you said that, uh, you know, the last the last few years have been kind of iffy. Yeah, you know, when you say seven years, I mean that could still be 2019 at this point. You just really don't know. Um, you know, it, it could be 14 years ago at this point. We just who, who knows with time nowadays. But uh, yeah, and and, uh, and and good and good on you about about you know shoving the cats out because uh, they they are want to get in the way of everything. So. Uh, oh, yeah. We've known we've known a few to jump actually over the camera and into a lap. So uh, you know, nothing nothing safe. <laughs> so I have a question. So you know, you worked for for Games Workshop. Have you and uh, and Gareth Anderhan ever ever talked ever talked shop about games and writing for games and so forth? I'm, I was curious. No, I'm, I mean I think the only time we've actually we've really talked at all was uh, we we did an orbit video together about 18 months ago I think it would have been now um, but uh, yes we're, we're, in, we're in different countries as well I realize it looks really close together from the other side of the Atlantic but it's it's quite a wee, wee distance from here so right. I'll have to I'll have to get y'all together I need to I need to do like a, a chat with like a bunch of authors that have also worked in, in gaming I think that'd be a really interesting chat uh yeah because uh you know he's the he's the first one that comes to mind but you know he also ran like a D, &D game for me during tbr con uh, back in january too so it's just just real fresh in the mind and then i'm pretty sure uh you know steve McHugh is on that and he, he's big into legos too so maybe i'll have to bring him in as well um so uh did you read a lot growing up on um, you know who were some of your favorite authors or what were some of your favorite novels when you were younger um so most of my my early reading uh, came in the form of Doctor Who novelizations, most of which are still on the shelves over here. Um, and again, because I can't do anything unless I'm doing it obsessively, then it became a question of, can I track them all down? Can I get them all together? To the point that even when they've been doing these slightly weird up-to-date issues of some of them to fill gaps that they never did before for various license reasons, uh, they've had to be bought and they've had to be squeezed on for the shelf somehow. Um, but beyond that, I'm, I mean, probably my introduction to fantasy was with The Hobbit, 
um because it was something that uh, that my mum first read to me actually when when i was very young and then from there uh, i got my hands on the copy of lord of the rings that was in the school library uh why they had it in you know like a like a four to, age four to ten school library i don't know um and I was discouraged from reading it a lot of the time. So, oh no, you won't understand it, you won't understand it. But it actually turned out that I did remember a lot of it. Um, to the point of, no, there are two bad guys whose names begin with S. And some of the other bits and pieces obviously went in a little bit more fog on the barrel and scared me to death. Yeah. Uh, because it's one of those chapters that is kind of creepy all by itself, but when your imagination is then always like about four or five steps ahead of what's going on in the book, you actually sort of, Please terrify yourself before the writer does anything of that to you. Um, I did that. I did that a lot actually with some of the books. There was one of the Doctor Who novelizations on the shelves behind me. And you go. By the time I'd got that fifteen pages into it, I'd invented my own story for the thing that was happening in the front, and I actually scared myself so I stopped reading it. So that would have been about the same time actually. Um, so yeah. Uh, who knows how many books I've actually read that I've actually read and I haven't just created my own story and decided I liked it or didn't based on that. That's right. slightly worrying. <laughs> it's just like, you know, all those people that ask, you know, have you read so-and-so? Like, yeah, yeah, it was great. <laughs> like, I, my book has never been taken off my shelf. <laughs> Why don't we do that to ourselves? I don't know, because then you get into a conversation about it. You have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Uh, no, beyond that, I think I had a lot of we had a lot of uh, books by a chap called Douglas Hill around when I when I was a kid, um, and he would write. He would prob. I don't think they'd quite be young adult these days. They'd be whatever the grade is behind that. I don't do categorization of books terribly well, but they tended to be sort of. Uh, they were all fantasy and science fiction stuff. There was a lot of dystopian stuff in there of one kind or another. Um, but the main one that leapt out was something called the Last Legionary series, which is, which was absolutely fantastic just in terms of what else was around, particularly at that time, because I, I'm, I'm old enough that I, I can remember the, the time well before sort of, uh, sort of genre stuff became a lot more mainstream, particularly for kids. And you would, you would get these very life affirming tales you know, that you're supposed to read as a child and then your teacher would put into your hand and you'll go away and read that and go, I'm really, really bored now. Why on earth do I want to read ever again? Um, and yeah, no names, no patrol, because all tastes are different and you never know who might be watching. But um, it, it was quite a rough patch, I think, sort of like this when I was about eight or nine and said, no, you're not reading Lord of the Rings again. Go and read this thing. Right. This thing with lots of flowers and a small child on the front of it. I, no, I don't want to do that. Uh, so I, I found Douglas Hill at about the right time. Um, and yeah, it just kind of continued from there, really. I have to admit, I don't, and I haven't read a lot of fantasy um, over the years, just because, again, there was so little of it that was commonly available, particularly in the, the local library. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I read most of the big names. I, re I read all of Shinara that was out at the time, as and when they would come back in. So I think I read that completely out of sequence. Um, and I read about three quarters of June and other bits and pieces like that. But yeah, there was never that much around. So eventually I ended up sort of gravitating into things like Tom Clancy and Bernard Cornwall, which are a very different kind of thing. Um, and yeah, you know, people say my books are long, but yeah, they hold nothing to a Tom Clancy book. Yeah, I mean, you know, th this series is pretty long. I mean, you're you're talking seven seven hundred pages plus for just every, every one. So, yeah, and you know, it's quite nicely spaced though. Whereas <laughs> books of that size, when I I you know I was twenty, were sort of they were standard paperback size and seven point. Oh experience. yeah, so yeah. You know, even, even like the mass paperbacks, pages. you know, are like that big. You know, you look at like the the original like Game of Thrones paperbacks that that were the the mass size and like the you know the prints teeny tiny, and yet there's like no space <laughs> anywhere, yeah. and it's still a thousand pages. Yeah, no, I was uh you know I was talking to some uh, contributors yesterday. We're we're starting up a podcast, um, so we kind of did like a little intro video or intro chat, 
And, uh, and somebody was mentioning reading the Hobbit and that being kind of their introduction, but then they got to Lord of the Rings and they're like, I don't understand freaking anything that's going on. I'm too young for this. So I'm going to move on to the next thing. So I was interested to, to, to hear what you said about it. Cause yeah, I, I don't, I don't think four to 10 is uh, quite the age range to really comprehend what's going on. I remember getting a copy of Lord of the Rings and opening it and going, holy crap, I don't, I, I got nothing. I got nothing on this. And I was so used to having to read the same kind of like you know, books in, in grade school where I just go, oh my gosh, this is my summer reading. This is literally how I have to spend my summer. So I always waited to the last week and just like skimmed it, looked for spark notes, something to be like, oh yeah, I totally read it. I read this 400 page novel uh, that I actually never opened. <laughs> no, I, I have to admit when, when I moved up to the Silmarillion, I still, I found that completely opaque. Uh, and I think to this day, probably I, I have only properly read maybe about two thirds of it. Um, I would normally just skip to the back where it said, of the third age and the rings of power. I think I know this story and this is actually written a lot more approachably than the rest of it. Um, and then I think Alakabeth, which leads into it, which is the fall of Numenor, is actually a really nice little section because it's very discreet. But I think probably one of the weirdly one of the challenges in the Silmarillion beyond the the slightly noty and very dry form of it, because of course it is all presented uh, almost like recounting the history and you get to say a role play gazetteer or something like that. Mm. It's the fact that you don't have those natural rhythm points in it. So you know when you're getting to the close of a particular part of the story, whereas of course with the Alakabeth or the, uh, which I'm probably mispronouncing, it's probably Akalabeth, I can't remember now. Um, I'm just losing all of my talking credibility in this conversation, but, by the time you get to those you go okay now it's a section it's about this long so i kind of feel i understand what the pace is and whereas in the rest of the book of course it's there and then it was all right for a moment and then a bad thing happened and then another bad thing happened and you weren't attached to this guy were you because this guy's going to go mad and kill everybody and then another bad thing happened and then it will just keep going on on, on like that and you're never quite sure when you're hitting a new phase in the story at least i wasn't maybe maybe uh Maybe I should try it again at some point, but the only the only copy I've got, I've got an enormous hardback up there, and I've got a teeny tiny paperback, which <laughs> again is six point X and no leading. It's uh, right. It's going to be a challenge. It may need to find its way onto the Kindle to make it easier to follow. <laughs> yeah, I think I think a lot of people have had that similar kind of you know notion when trying to read the similar, and they're just kind of like, yeah, just just it's too much. I, I can't because yeah, I I feel like I need a, a specific beginning and end to like be able to to put it aside because like you kind of mm. feel like you're not quite there yet you know uh when you're reading it so yeah I, to your point yeah i i'm going to try it on audio i, I have a feeling it's going to be a horrible experience but i'm going to at least going to attempt it um yeah I, uh, it, it, like it's like daunting to even think about it <laughs> so um as far as your writing goes who directly or maybe even indirectly inspired you to start writing um why I started way back when, because I, I had a brief fling with it uh, when I was around 20. Um, and it, I stopped doing it largely for the same reasons that I, I stopped doing a lot of things is go, oh, I spent, spent ages doing this and the, there's almost nothing to show for this. How do people do this? Every, uh, you know, um, so I don't know why I started particularly at, at that point. Um, I certainly had a lot of lot of influences over the years and they they tend to have a very similar tones so I, th I think we talked about Bernard Cornwall um, mm -hmm. and actually he's probably most responsible for the style of how I'll portray battles for example because he's um, got a very very crisp but very detailed style but then he also is really fantastic about then zooming back out again so you can go ah, I see how this fits in so if you go and read something like one of the books from the Sharp series, particularly some of the earlier ones, you'll get that idea. You can see the entire battle, even though it's spread across miles and miles and miles and miles, and you're really just following Sharp around mm -hmm. through the rest of it. But you know what's going on at any given time, and it's, it's just fantastic. Um, and I think there are a lot of people owe him a huge debt because I've never quite read anyone else who manages to bring that kind of micro and macro scale to, to the story at the same time um from a sort of tone and character point of view um 
my influences tend to be a chap called Timothy Zahn, who is not, probably lots of people, this being a, a book thing, will have heard of him, but generally speaking, I don't think he's that well heard of in this country, certainly. Uh, his big claim to fame, and I, how I found him, was back at, in the 90s when he wrote the, you know, the official sequel trilogy for Star Wars, as it was back then, The Bear to mm -hmm. the Empire. And, for, and that was, it's, it's really easy to become slightly jaded by that now, because again, of course, time fiction is massive these days. Right. Um, but that was, that was incredible, because of course, everyone was waiting for a new Star Wars film, and uh, to actually pick something up and felt like all the characters had come alive, and it had just the right amount of touches of bringing some of those secondary, so sort of the, the B-list characters through to the Z-list characters, so many of them are actually present and then fleshed out a little bit in the story. Mm -hmm. I would say that probably he is still most responsible for the reason that Mon Mothma, for example, is actually a character in later films because Zahn did so much and put her at the centre of it. So you, you have a, no, this is what the leader of the rebellion is and this is what she does. Oh, I see. Um, and then of course there are the, you know, his, his Bounty characters because Thrawn, of course, has escaped the collapse of the um, the expanded Star Wars universe and is now back largely in the same kind of form that he was in, mm -hmm. uh, and has since got a trilogy all to himself. That as far I've not read the second Thrawn trilogy, but it, it seems like he's starting to break out into his own little space again, yeah. which is wonderful. I'm personally, I I loved Talon Card actually. He was my favourite character, and then years later hearing Zahn talk about him and say. No, no, he was based on Paul Darrow's version of Avon from Blake 7. That'd be why I liked it, because I'd love that as well. Um, but then the other name that I'd throw into it is J. Michael Straczynski, who, uh, is, again, a huge career. He's, he, you, if you've heard of him, you probably know him as the guy who created Babylon 5, but he's done so much other stuff over the years. Mm. Uh, he's written Spider-Man, he's written Superman. Um, he's he's just everywhere across genre television and he's just very very good at capturing sort of that wonderful balance of character humor and for want of a better phrase epic um which i would fold tragedy into there as well and yeah it's that he's just splendid and he's one of those people where, where i will write something I will have to go back and do a reading. Go, All right, have I stolen anything from Straczynski? Because I really shouldn't do that. Uh, and there, there have been cases when I've had a manuscript back where I've, I've gone through and said, I don't think this is from the, something that he's written, but I'm just going to change it just to be sure. Because I just can't. Uh, yeah, uh, that, that would that would appall me if I've <laughs> done that. But no, he's a, a fantastically huge influence. And he's, yeah, I think anyone who is whether you're established or whether you are just getting started, he's a great, great guy to learn from. Just go and consume some of his content because he's really a master at what he does. Okay. Yeah, I uh, I agree on Zahn. And yeah, you know, it's one of those things where like, I feel like people know Timothy Zahn and I feel like they know that he writes Star Wars. But at the same time, I feel like Star Wars is like so big that people just see the title and not the author's name. And so people may not know who yeah. Timothy Zahn is. Like they just read Star Wars and they're like, I love Star Wars. So here it is. Um, but yeah, the, the, you know, the Throne Children is like massive, especially like on audio that Mark Thompson uh, does the audio for. Um, I don't know if you've listened to any of his audio books, but if you read, if you love Star Wars, if you read Star Wars, I recommend, even if you're not like an audiobook aficionado, uh, Mark Thompson's amazing. He does like the entire cast of characters they all sound exactly how you expect them to sound, like just like you're watching a movie. You know, there's sound effects, there's lasers, there's explosions, all kind of stuff. Uh, so that's really cool. But yeah, uh, I feel like Zahn's pretty big over here. But at the same time, again, I, you know, I think it just kind of comes down to you see Star Wars, you don't really see author name. Uh, but I, I could be wrong. There could be plenty of circles that I'm not a part of that, that see it differently. So, no, I, I mean, I, I know that when, when I started buying up, a lot of my zombies. so I went through a phase of picking up everything. Uh, I since things condensed back down a little bit, but I would those I would have to order from Amazon. So that was quite recently. Certainly, when mm. like 15, 20 years ago, I was having to go to um, shops like Another World, which has long since vanished over here, but it used to be sort of comics and sort of uh, 
film, TV, just for want of a better phrase, sort of geek jobs, effectively. And they would occasionally carry a couple of his books in there. Uh, but you just didn't tend to get them in mainstream bookshops over here. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, the, the 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 other series of his that I really really love is basically the, the Quadrail series, which again is it's a science fiction one. It's his it's his own universe. It's very much a sort of uh, almost noir pulp investigation in the far future. Uh, and there's always this little kernel of what reads to me is uh, anyway as with my little novice brain on science it, it, there's always this sort of uh, there is a science hook at the center of everything that he does um and he certainly convinces it but it certainly uh, presents it convincingly enough that i go no no i believe that that's the thing and this is the thing that could happen uh, and i think because of his background probably there's there's really good solid theoretical physics behind it but mm -hmm. The fact that he then conveys that, because that's that's the worst bit. That was derails so much science fiction. You get into it, and then the author tells you, "Let me explain to you how this MacGuffin works, and to show you that I've done my back." It's, it's, it's always like from fancy talking about uh, uh, creating viruses or atomic bombs. And you go, "Well, that was fifty pages of my life. <laughs> I would have taken your word for it. It's fine." Um, <laughs> And you know it's kind of engrossing, but it it does wear you down after a while. But no, just yeah. just making quite dense information and um, making it palatable and communicating it is it, it's just splendid. I would recommend to anyone who wants to try science fiction but is worried about it getting too heavy to pick up something by Timothy Vaughan because they are first and foremost character books and then everything else is the setting and he just conveys it brilliantly. Okay. Yeah, I, I, knew, uh, I knew he had a, a recent trilogy, I think out through Tor, uh, that came out within the last couple of years as well. So I, I, I need to, I need to check it out because yeah, I think all, only stuff I've read by him is, is the star Wars stuff. So it's good. It's good to know that his science fiction stuff's you know, just as good. So, um, so tell me a little bit about your craft. Are you a gardener, an architect or somewhat of a scaffolder? I'm actually going to steal this one from Cameron Johnston because he, he mentioned that he was a scaffolder the other day. <laughs> okay. The disadvantage of that, of course, is that you now have to explain to me what you just said. <laughs> Do you uh do you, do you plot everything out or do you uh do you just write by you fly by the seat of your pants? Uh, or do you yes. do a little bit of both? <laughs> <laughs> it will depend book by book. Um and then uh, sometimes I'll get part way through something and then I will completely change my approach. Uh so I I have one one thing sitting around as a manuscript which was meticulously plotted because where the character beats fell alongside some of the scenes and how that had to evolve the only way I could give myself the confidence that I was doing it right I had to write it down I had a chapter breakdown bullet points for each chapter and I hated writing it <laughs> because there were no surprises for me yeah. um, and I think that's that's something that um certainly certainly from my point of view is hugely important for keeping me engaged with something that I'm writing is yeah. that I get to find out bits of the story as it goes along as well. Um, which isn't to say that I'm not happy with this particular book. I think it's wonderful. I think it's, it's I, I'm hoping one day to see it in print, but uh, it was a bind to write because it's just, so what am I doing today then? And it's just like having this little tick list and go, right, have I done that? Have I done that? Have I done that? Have I been good? Have I eaten my greens? Right, fantastic. <laughs> Maybe I can put a joke in the chapter now. And, um, yeah, but on the other side of things, actually beyond a few, right, I need to get here, or this is kind of the midpoint of the book, this is where the book ends, the legacy books were a lot more freeform than that. Um, mm. Particularly Legacy of Ash, obviously the further you get through a series, you've got more things that you need to finish off, you've got more uh, character arcs that you need to actually get to a meaningful conclusion for there are there are threads that you need to make sure you've got tied off um but there's still always scope in that to go oh here's a fun thing let's put that in that'll be fine um and so you can actually enjoy some of those moments uh, a little bit more so yeah it the only answer is it depends um mm -hmm. but i'm like that with everything is that I, how i will approach anything is kind of different one day <laughs> I oh, know he will think very carefully about this. No, no, that's going to do it spontaneously. Uh, but other times I will want to sit down and I will need to know dates, times, people, process, all the rest of it. 
Um, so yeah, bit of a mix. Yeah, depends on how you slept the night before, how you woke up, have you had your coffee or your tea yet? Did you know? Did your cat, you know, claw, you know, your leg this morning? Uh. <laughs> oh, I wish it was even as quantifiable as that. It's just the, uh, this is what feels right today. Let's go and do that. So probably just for the best. I'm not running the country, but then again, mm, it's a low bar. Yeah, <laughs> there's not a whole lot to really you know step up on that is. <laughs> So um, let's let's talk about your legacy trilogy. So can you um, can you tell the audience a little bit about the series so far? Okay, so the so the baseline that I, I do when I talk about the legacy trilogy um, and the individual books is that it's about new generations uh, learning to uh, live with the mistakes of the one that came before them. Uh, so we have a set of two neighboring empires. It's always Two neighboring realms, there we go, let's avoid repeating words, uh, which is the Trestan Republic and the Hadari Empire. And they they have been at war on and off for as long as anyone can remember, um, mostly because they have been at war with each other for as long as anyone can remember at this point rather than anything else. Um, and so a lot of the core conflict arises out of that, but it's the things that are done in prosecution of that war in search of peace along the way that is that drives the story. So uh, in the first book, Legacy of Ash, um, somewhere along the way, basically half of the Tresian Republic, the southern half of it decided that it no longer wanted to be governed from the city of Tresia in the north because it was all going terribly, terribly wrong for them. And they were essentially being used as farmland to support the armies. Uh, so they, they had an uprising which was brutally put down and ever since a second uprising has been building and that's where we come in with legacy of ash which is then complicated because that's exactly the same point in time that the current de facto ruler of the hadari empire who is not yet an emperor but wants to prove that he's capable of being wants to go and win a huge military victory to prove his his worth basically uh so it then becomes a, a, almost a three-way conflict on both on that macro scale with the South Shires sort of caught between both its own republic and then the empire that's going to sweep in and maybe occupy it. And whether or not that's actually going to be, are they better with one side or another? Is there a way out of it for them? And then all the individuals involved in it are ones who have inherited the problems of the past. So you have Victor Cadra, who was responsible for putting down the original rebellion in the South Shires. And has since come to realize what a terrible mistake that was and is desperate to try and unpick it from the inside but no one listens to him because he is just young victor you know and you know you don't know how these things are done and this is very important so no don't don't worry about it in the meantime you have jasiri Trelan, who is the son of the woman who led that original rebellion and he's steadily been building towards getting a second one in the way but he's terrified of what will happen as and when that comes to pass. Uh, and it's been so long now that it's almost easier for him to take a step back and go, no, no, we're not quite ready. We'll wait another, we'll make just another five minutes. It'll be fine. Um, and so they very quickly end up at loggerheads with each other with Jasiris' sister, Kalen, caught in the middle because she wants nothing to do with the family legacy. Uh, and would just like to be able to go away and live her life, thank you very much, but is just caught in the orbit of her brother and Victor. And then in the meantime, you have the Hadari crashing in from the east uh, and uh, the, uh, the would-be emperor's daughter trying to prove herself that she is actually then capable of inheriting from her father should he manage to prove himself. So everyone is dealing with a huge weight of tradition and history. And that's that's just the main characters. Everyone else has their, their past. There are soldiers on all sides who have been part of previous conflicts who are forced to reappraise which side they should be on and why. Um, and then as we go through into Legacy of Steel and then into Legacy of Light, everyone has their own mistakes to worry about as well. Um, so things are and things are said and done at the end of Legacy of Ash, which then immediately feed into Legacy of Steel and provoke another round of conflict, both within the characters, some of which who have gone from enemies to friends and then are back to enemies or uh, we don't know, ask us again latest. Um, and then 
yeah, then the Republic and the Empire are at one another's throats again, and then even the gods start to get involved at that point, um, just, in, just in case it wasn't complicated enough for everyone. Um, because obviously when the gods get involved, it gets a little bit more sticky all around. Right. Um, and then when everyone finally gets out of Legacy of Steel, largely intact, we then, um, there's about six months to a year between Legacy of Ash and Legacy of Steel. Uh, but then between Legacy of Steel and Legacy of Light, uh, we've got about five years between those two books because Legacy of Steel ends things where at a point of transformation effectively for both the, um, the Hadari Empire and the Tresian Republic. And then Legacy of Light shows you how things have changed uh, and what still needs to change, I think. It's probably the fairest way I can put that. Does that make any kind of sense? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this series, you know, it's 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 epic in just pretty much every sense of the word. You know, did you originally set out to write such a sprawling epic fantasy? And you, was it was it all like already in your mind? Like, this is how it's going to start. This is how it's going to end. And I'm going to make sure it's all you know, 700 pages <laughs> per book. Um, or you know, did it did it start out a little bit smaller and then it just kind of grew over time? So um, one of the- one of those stories that both started a long time ago and almost never got written in a way because 20 odd years ago I was using it as the basis of trying to have a basically a, a set of law for sort of war games and board games and things like that mm-hmm. and I, I steadily developed bits and pieces of it and part of the story that has become the legacy trilogy came out of that so in terms of actually particularly how the whole trilogy ends um pretty much the last thing that happens in Legacy of Light has been written in potential for 20 plus years at this mm-hmm. point. And then some of the midpoints are in there. Some of the characters have always been part of it. So for example, Jasiri, Victor and Malachi have always been part of that story. Um, and then having, you know, as you do when you, you go through the ringer, when you start writing novels, you go, oh, I'll write a novel and I'll approach agents and then after you've done six of those, you'll be taken on by an agent and then you'll do another three books before someone will actually take you on and publish something. And I kind of hit the point where I said, right, so what am I going to do now? Because I've always got a list of things that I can go and tackle. And there was just part of me going after, you know, I think I, think I, I was about eight or nine completed novels into... Um, into the process before Legacy of, Lo- Legacy of Ash got picked up. And it was there, well, I may as well try and do this one. I'm not sure I can do this justice, but I may as well try and do it because that's about learning and it's a different scale. It's a different story. And I know a lot of the answers that creep in around the outside of this one. Um, so it started off like that. And again, I kind of knew where the end was. I wasn't sure where the beginning was until I started writing it and then and I've spoken about this a little bit before there's a point about I think it's about 10 chapters in in terms of the published version although the chapter breaks moved a little bit between draft and final publication um where I just decided to introduce some other characters into the story because I there was a bit in the back of my head going no oh, this will make it better you need to do this um and it was a little bit weird for one reason or another, but they they went in there and suddenly the rest of the story came to life at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, and those characters are basically the Hadari side of the equation, Legacy of Ash, so they are specifically Malana, uh, Ashana and the Huntsman. And actually bringing all those together, that I think is actually where, for want of a better phrase, where the magic happens with the trilogy because you are now seeing both sides for what they are. And you'll see how they lie to each other and how how events look different from the opposite sides of the, the battlefield. And that's actually, I think that just did me a huge number of favors. didn't do the word count any favors, because obviously as soon as you do that, it just sort of balloons. Right. Um, but it really helped bring everything to life. Um, and along the way, obviously, it grew plenty more characters. Characters like Kirkus and Anastasia are not were not part of the original uh, story but the original story is incredibly thinly written it's like three paragraphs in a word document i've still got somewhere um 
and then it kind of grew outwards from there. And I think so. Legacy of Ash, when I drafted it for the first time, was about 285,000 words, which by comparison, the published book is about 240. Uh, I, I brought it down to about 235, and then more stuff went in based off the edits. Um, but the goal was never to write anything that long. It was to go, well, if I'm going to try and do this properly, don't self-edit till it's done. And on a, you know, on a couple of occasions, I was talking to my agent about it. It feels like it's getting really long now. Are you sure that's like, oh, don't worry about it. You can always edit it down afterwards. And he was right. He was absolutely right. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's. And then of course the thing because, well, the other ones have to be the same length. Is there going to be enough content to fill the other two books? And that actually hasn't been a problem. Uh, and I think partly because so many things are then set up and there are so many characters in place. Uh, by the time you get to something that's got such an ensemble cast as the Legacy Trilogy, you have to remember that every character is somebody's favourite character. Right, right, yeah. exactly. Because I've been, I've been running polls on Twitter again on the, 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 the run-up to Legacy of Light and everyone has people rooting for them. Um, in terms of who is the person that they would most want to help them if things went terribly wrong. There are some slightly strange choices in there, I have to say. <laughs> Always. <laughs> who, who picked that one? That's, that's really interesting. Do you have a death wish? Um, but I'm going to need to talk to you I'll, later. <laughs> yeah. Are you okay? Um, but there are... But yeah, you have to do right by all of the characters. You can't just forget one of them part way through. Yeah. Um, so making sure that everyone gets, not necessarily the end people want, but they get a satisfying end. That that then that's the momentum that takes you forward through the rest of the series. Yeah, I can only imagine that you finish your you finish your series, and then there's like that one person that comes back and you're like, "What about this character? You haven't written about them since you know the end of book one, and I'm pretty sure they're still alive." <laughs> So I can only imagine you, you have them all written down and like you just like cross them out when they die. And like, okay, I got to make sure this person fits in. <laughs> it's not quite that bad. I mean, as I, as I understand it, there are a lot more, there are a lot more sort of, uh, I'm not even sure if is the right word, but there are a lot more sort of almost incidental but significant speaking parts in something like Game of Thrones, for example, where the cast mm-hmm. runs in for scores of people that you want to keep track of. I think even though the Legacy Trilogy has a not undeserved reputation for having a lot of characters to keep track of, in terms of the core that you need to follow, it's never more than about a dozen. Yeah. Uh, and obviously, as the books tick by, some, some of those characters die and then other ones come in. And then most of the ones around the outside um, are so incidental that they don't matter too much. But now, of course, someone's going to read Legacy of Light and go, well, I wanted to know more about this character. Why haven't you done that? And uh, that's fine. Be sure to shout at me on Twitter and I'll post <laughs> a list of things I should do later. Right. Here's the things I'll get to in the next decade. <laughs> so, yeah, so so Legacy of Light. So this this beauty right here, which I'm sure you can see in, in Matthew's background as well. Um, so it's coming out uh, on the 17th of August. So, I mean, gosh, just in eight days here in the U.S. and then on the 19th in the U.K. So for readers of the first two books of the series, you know, what can they expect in the grand finale? I know you've kind of touched on it, but, uh, you know, what what is, I guess, is the expectation going into uh, to our, our trilogy finale? Oh, it's a really hard one to talk about because it's, it's kind of spoilers right from the start. Um, but... So starting from the back and working way in is that you, you will see a conclusion to everything. There are no there are no hanging threads in this after this. You 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 get you genuinely get to see how it all ends. Uh, you will see a couple of characters that you maybe weren't expecting to see. You will see some characters that you maybe didn't realize were as significant as they were in some previous books. And obviously. The heart of the book, as with the previous ones, is the weird, uh, what's the word, frenemyship between Victor and Josiri, and how that continues down the line. I, thought, I really want to hate this guy, but but I think we might be friends. That's horrible. <laughs> um, yeah, every, everything that you've already seen in the other books, I think if, if you've been with me this far, you're going to have a hell of a time with it, because I think 
everyone gets to everyone gets a, a great moment or two in the story and we there's really a definite sense of I don't want to use the word finalities that makes it sound really ominous uh, but there's definitely a sense of closure at the end of this book I think you will know that you've reached the end of this part of the story if you see what I mean um, but everything that we've come to expect we we have lots of uh, Lots, lots of banter between characters. We have big battles. We have magic and mystery and strange creatures creeping in at the edges of reality. And of course, some of the gods are back because obviously we like the gods a lot because they just like to throw things into the pond and see what happens. And that's always entertaining. Right. And I think you're good with saying finalities. As long as you don't say fatalities, I think I think people will <laughs> still be on board with you. <laughs> that's a bit serious, yes. <laughs> so, um, so now that the series is finished, can you pick a favorite character? Um, see, I always weasel my way out of this and then eventually come back and say, I really like Anastasia because she gets to say so many things I wish I could, but you don't last long if you do. <laughs> People very, very quickly get tired of you being quite that honest with them. Um, so yeah, Anna is always a good time. She's always fantastic to write, particularly what she brings out in the other characters because obviously the main pairing that you see in legacy of steel is anna and kirkus and they are just wonderful foils for each other um but it's even it doesn't matter who she's talking to it's just a good time to write and to read i think whether she's issuing veiled threats or putting people down or just having a little bit of fun at their expense she's just wonderful um i really enjoy savarka as well because savarka was a character that on and off could have been, ended up being cut from Legacy of Ash earlier on. If, she was, if, if the notes came back from Orbit, say, no, no, you need to lose X number of characters and this many thousands of pages from the book, uh, thousands of pages, thousands of words from the book, then Savarka was one of those characters which, while I knew there was a lot of stuff that she brings to Legacy of Ash, particularly towards the end, she could have been removed. But actually now seeing her throughout the series and just seeing how she's grown and again seeing how readers have actually started to fall in love with her character as well as they've gone through as she's grown because she's definitely come further than almost anyone else in the story i think from uh, her, her slightly uh, i don't really want anyone to notice me can this all just go away origins so yes i i have a huge soft spot for her as well but i don't think there's any of the one that i actively don't like because it's it's a fairly big red flag for you go, I really hate writing this character. I don't want to spend any time with this person. Maybe I should do something about that. Because if I feel that way, then other people are going to feel that way. And the nature of sort of subjective taste is there's going to be characters that, even if you love the books, there are going to be characters you go, oh, not this one again. I was I want to read more about this one over here. So inviting that by having someone in that even I don't have the confidence of going, yes, this is a the person that's okay to spend time around that that would be weird <laughs> so um so moment what are you what are you working on now can you can you talk a little bit about uh about it or is it still super hush hush I know a lot of authors are very hush hush on this question so um it's all kinds of different bits of hush hush um because to be honest um for the last for nearly the last year now actually i've been i've been on the day it's all the day job but the the day job that is working for other people mm. um which is something like depending on how you count it it's like three or four video games and some other bits and pieces along the side and i yeah i can't talk about almost any of those i'm still working away on the ongoing support for vermintide 2 which is the only thing i can name check at this stage mm. um as far as book projects, there's a whole queue of them lined up, and I think we're just waiting to see uh, where the dice fall on that one. But I'm hoping that there will be something we can talk about for too much longer. But uh, everything everything is really quiet until it's really loud, as I'm sure you've, you've probably noticed over the years now. Oh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, like I say, the, there is always a list, a laundry list of things that I can go to. I mean, one of, the, one of the great things actually is that I found one of my older laundry lists of things and go, oh, I've actually written three books on that and they've been published now or are about to be published. So that's fantastic forward motion. Uh, but of course, when you take three things off a list like that, another five things go on. So you never really win. Um, but yeah, the, I'm, I'm hoping to get to grips with something from that list very, very soon. And I'm sure I will make a lot of noise about it when I know what that is and when I can. 
<laughs> Fantastic. Um, have you uh, have you read anything recently that you'd recommend to the audience? Um, it's, again, I, I read so little these days. Um, the most recent thing I read actually was um, a book called Becoming a Writer, Staying a Writer by J. Michael Straczynski, which I weirdly I got sent a review copy of. Because uh, I was looking at thinking, oh, should I read that? Should I read that? And, and then the publishers got in touch with me via the website because they clearly have no idea how few people visit my website. So they said, oh, we um, you know, would, would you like a copy so you can and do a review of it? And um, yeah, free book, free book's good, free book by someone I admire, that's great stuff. Um, and it's, it has genuinely, um, with a big caveat of, yes, I received a free copy. And I was probably going to like it anyway for all the reasons that I talked about earlier. Um, it's a really good resource, actually, uh, particularly if you're getting started. I think there's a lot of very good advice there. I think some of it, because he's primarily a screenwriter, some of it isn't going to apply, to, for example, for sort of prose novels and things like that. But I think just some of the habits and some of the lessons. And as with all writing advice, just seeing what someone else has done and how they would approach things and when that worked for them and when it didn't. It's obviously we're all different. We've all got different ways of working and there is no quick fix for getting your craft together. But yeah, it, it's, it's very, very engaging. It's a very quick read, uh, not because it's particularly short, but just because of the style in which he writes. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, yeah, if, if someone's looking to get started, I think that's a fantastic book to pick up. Fantastic. Well, again, uh, I want to thank the amazing people at The Broken Binding for, for putting this together. They live to serve all of your fantasy and science fiction needs with signed books, fantastic reprints, and the most amazing grift wrapping you could ever ask for. So make sure to visit them at thebrokenbinding.co.uk. Tell them the FFA crew sent you. You can also use the promo code FANFI, that's F-A-N-F-I, at checkout for a little discount on your purchase. Um, but Matthew, uh, I want to thank you so much for sitting down today and having a chat with me. And congratulations on the close of this fantastically epic series. Again, Legacy of Light is coming very, very soon. Again, on the 17th in the U.S., 19th in the U.K. Um, and I wish you the best of luck with publication and we cannot wait to see what you've got coming out next. Thank you. Absolutely.